Hi. Whew, we've got exams next week and the second year medical students, they know so much that they only ask me hard questions now. So my brain is a bit frazzled. So let's, you and me, introduce the anatomy of the head. I'll keep it nice and low level, but we'll introduce lots of nice terms about the anatomy of the head. And then you can use that to jump off to all the far more detailed videos that I've already recorded, all right? What is the head? <laughs> yeah, we're starting there. So the head is the bit above the neck. It's superior to the neck. Essentially it is, so this is the cranium and it is the cranium and all the soft tissues around it and the stuff inside it as well. That's the head. So the head then sits on top of the vertebral column. So it's superior to the cervical vertebrae and there are a number of muscles in the neck that help support it and hold it in place. Um, and this being the cranium, there are a number of bones here, but this bit has got the brain inside. This is, inside there is the cranial cavity, a bony box. This is the neurocranium because it surrounds the brain. And this here is the viscerocranium, the face. And in the face, we do have some viscera, we have some organs. We've got, you know, like the lacrimal glands and the eyes and the salivary glands and that sort of thing. So the head is divided into the neurocranium and the viscerocranium. Now, if we look at the face, so if we take the skin off the face and the skin off the scalp, uh, we can see a number of muscles. These muscles here are the muscles of facial expression. They're moving the skin. They're letting us express our emotions. They're closing the lips, closing the eyes. So these are the muscles of facial expression. And they get called that because they all do a similar job, but also they're innervated by a particular cranial nerve. We'll come on to the idea of cranial nerves later. Uh, whereas there are some muscles, like this muscle here, masseter, that move the mandible. So there's the mandible, the jawbone. The muscles that move the mandible to help us chew are the muscles of mastication. So the muscles of the face get separated into muscles of facial expression and muscles of mastication. And the mas muscles of mastication are innervated by a different cranial nerve. The face, it sticks out a little bit in us hominids, not as far as it does in other anim animals. Aminals? Um, but I need to cut a section through here to show you what's inside. So there's the face. And that's us cutting a mid-sagittal section, a section right down the midline. And now we can see what's going on in the face. And you can see the brain. So this is what I was talking about, the cranial cavity. The bone goes all the way around here and surrounds the brain, which is important. Not that the brain is important, but that anatomical concept is important because it affects what goes on in here. But now look at the face. We've got some really big spaces here. So this is the nasal cavity. This goes back maybe further than you think. You know, you've seen magicians maybe hammering nails into their nose. Well, that's why they can do it because the nasal cavity goes back a long way. So the nasal cavity is primarily for airflow down to the lungs. And we have some bony shapes here covered in uh, mucosa, a um, well vascularized mucosa. So what's happening here is, is that the air as it enters the nasal cavity is warmed up and humidified before it goes to the lungs, which is better for the lungs. It stops the lungs draining out, drying out. And for gases exchange to occur in the lungs, those lungs need to be moist. So that's the, the nasal cavity. This little opening here, that is where the middle ear opens up. Um, at the back of the nasal cavity. So beyond the nasal cavity, more posteriorly, we have the pharynx. Up here, this is the nasopharynx. That there, you know when you, you're on a plane and you, your ears kind of block a little bit or you're going up and down hills in a car and your ears block and then you swallow or you suck on a boiled sweet? Well, what's happening there is muscles are pulling on that opening and air can go into or come out of that tube that connects to the middle ear, it equalizes the pressure in your ear so your ear feels better and normal again. We will come around to the ear. So there's the nasal cavity. These spaces you can see here, these are sinuses in the bones of the face. 
They may be there to help humidify the air and warm the air. They may be there to lighten the weight of the face. They may be there to change the characteristics of your voice as you speak. They may be there for all of those reasons and other reasons, but these are the sinuses. This is the sphenoid sinus here, for example. And we can also see tonsils. This is the pharyngeal tonsil, also known as the adenoid tonsil. Tonsils are collections of, well, they're parts of the immune system. And there are a, a ring of tonsils around this entrance into the body so that the immune system can essentially monitor what's going in here and hopefully kill infections before they get down to more sensitive structures. You know what it's like when you've had an upper respiratory tract infection. Yet the immune system up here is fighting that. The entrance to the nasal cavity is the nose. And the nose, uh, much of its shape is formed by cartilage. The bone only extends so far and the rest of it is made up of cartilage. And there's actually a divider between the left and right nasal cavities. You've got two nostrils, left and right. Those go to two separate spaces, left and right. Um, and one tends to be a bit more blocked than the other all the time when they swap over. Anyway, so <laughs> this is the problem with introductory anatomy is I can just t talk forever. <laughs> when you do have an inflammation inside the nasal cavity, then this can all swell up as blood vessels dilate and what have you on one. And your nose gets blocked. It gets hard to pass air through there. And there are, this is a mucosa because the cells here can make mucus protecting that soft tissue lining, but they can make lots of mucus. They can make snot. The nasal cavity, let's stop at snot. Here, is a bone that separates the nasal cavity from the oral cavity. And if you look inside the oral cavity, you can see there's not a big space here. And that's because the tongue, when your mouth is closed, the tongue is filling all of that space inside the oral cavity. Only when you open your mouth do you have lots of space in your oral cavity. And this bone here that's separating the nasal cavity from the oral cavity is the hard palate. If you press the tongue to the roof of your mouth, you can feel that it's hard, that's bone, again covered in mucosa. And as we follow the hard palate posteriorly, we find the soft palate ending in the uvula. We might be able to get your tongue back posteriorly, back past the hard palate and feel how it gets softer. The soft palate is made up of muscle. And the purpose of the soft palate, the main purpose is when you swallow, Tongue pushes against the roof of the mouth, pushes the bolus of food posteriorly and back to the esophagus, which is back here. And the, the soft palate elevates and separates off the nasal cavity from the oral cavity and from the rest of the pharynx. So obviously it doesn't do that most of the time. So you can breathe through this channel here, but when you swallow, you take a breath in and then you hold your breath, your breath while you swallow and the soft palate elevates and closes off the nasal cavity from the oral cavity to make sure food and drink goes that away and not up that away. We can see the tongue here, as I said. So this is a very, very muscular structure. You, it's a muscular structure. You can move it in many, many directions. Um, it seems like this is an unusual muscle that's only attached to one end and not the other end, but actually it's attached to the internal surface of the tongue. So the tongue's covered in mucosa again which is covered in um, special sensory cells and normal sensory cells. So you can sense temperature and pain and touch, but you can also sense taste. That's a specific thing for the tongue. Well, fairly specific. Um, and the muscles inside here, we've got fibers running in lots of different directions and they can pull on that internal surface of the tongue to change the shape of the tongue, which means you can make it long and thin which is when you push it out, or you can make it short and fat, which is when you pull it back in again. But you can also move the base of the tongue and that tip of the tongue around, which means you can move the bolus of food around your mouth to help you chew, and you can clean your teeth with your tongue, that sort of thing, right? Now, with this plane of section, we can only see a couple of teeth, but I think you're probably all aware that teeth go all the way around the mandible, and the bone up here is the maxilla, so you have these upper teeth and these lower teeth. Um, the other structure, so again, here's another tonsil, the lingual tonsil. There's another tonsil in there, the palatine tonsil. So the tonsils are parts of the immune system, 
but we also have these here. These are glands. This is a salivary gland. This is the parotid salivary gland. And it has this duct that runs around here to duct into the oral cavity through your cheek. And we have another salivary gland under here. So we have three pairs of salivary glands, sublingual, submandibular, and parotid. They're all producing saliva. Some of them uh, make a little bit more of a mucous saliva. Some of them make a bit more of a serous, a watery saliva. But they all secrete into the oral cavity. So the teeth, the saliva, this is where digestion starts. And then the food is sent down the esophagus and it continues in the stomach and so on. So that's the oral cavity. And just like the nasal cavity had the nasopharynx posteriorly to it, the oral cavity has the oropharynx posteriorly to that. Down here is the larynx, but that's the neck. So that's out of bounds for today. Okay, so that's much of the face. The obvious important structure in the face that you're looking at me with right now, if you're paying attention, is the eye. I can't see the eye in this model because those muscles of facial expression have closed the eye. Let's get another model. Here we can see the eye and the muscles of facial expression and the eye within the orbit. So the bony cavity that the eye resides within is the orbit. And um, inside the orbit, there are a number of extra ocular muscles, that is muscles outside the eye that are anchored to structures in the orbit. And they're the ones that move the eye. So the eye, you can move in many directions. You can also rotate your eye a little way. And the purpose of moving the eye is so that you can focus on something because at the back of the eye you have the retina which is sensing light but there's only a small portion the macula which is the bit that you're really looking at me with that focuses high density vision on something and being able to move your eyes means you can keep your macula focused on the thing you want to look at and also while you know while you're moving um, so there are extraocular muscles in there and also inside the eye we have intraocular muscles because as you've probably seen the pupil can dilate and constrict. So we have a pupilla, a dilator pupillae muscle and then a, a sphincter pupillae muscle. Uh, so there are intraocular muscles that change how much light enters the eye and also there's a lens inside the eye which focuses light on the retina. And there are muscles that change the shape of the lens so you can focus on objects that are near and far. So those are intraocular muscles. And then the eye um, is like the surface of the eye, the anterior surface of the eye is kept moist, it's kept protected uh, because it has a transparent layer um, the, so you can see through it, kind of, kind of obvious, right? whereas the rest of the eye is white, the sclera. Um, anyway, I, there's more anatomy in the orbit per square centimetre, per cubic centimetre, than anywhere else in the body. So I've got to limit myself. But up here is the lacrimal gland, and the lacrimal gland secretes lacrimal fluid, or tears, that sweep across the eye and are collected in this medial corner and pass through the nasolacrimal duct into the nasal cavity. So you either swallow them or if you're crying a lot, you, you know, dribble tears out through your nose. But the lacrimal gland up here. So the eye is for the special sense of vision. Um, but if you think the eye is bad, well, the ear isn't far off. This is the external ear, this fibrocartilaginous shape that sticks out of the side of your head so characteristically. And there's a hole in there, the, the external auditory meatus. And in that hole, there is a membrane, the tympanic membrane. And that tympanic membrane is sensitive enough that vibrations in the air will move that tympanic membrane. I was talking about pressure earlier. So really for that to work well, the pressure on either side of that tympanic membrane needs to be the same. Otherwise, if it's higher on one side than the other, it's gonna get stretched and it's not gonna be as sensitive, right? So the tympanic membrane is in that tube, but that tube essentially continues into the nasal cavity, into that opening there, which allows the equalization of pressure. So we have an external ear, we have a middle ear, and we have an inner ear. The middle ear, is um, the other side of the tympanic membrane. Ear, ear, external ear, 
there's the tympanic membrane, uh, there's that tube running to the tympanic membrane, tympanic membrane vibrates, there are little tiny tiny bones, the smallest bones in the body that take that, those vibrations and pass them to the cochlea. And the cochlea looks a little bit like a snail shell. Um, and inside there essentially you've got a long sheet with specialised neurons in there which have like hairs and there's a fluid in there. So those vibrations are then transmitted to the fluid. The vibrations pass along the fluid and they make those hairs move at different distances along that length, which is curled up into a spiral, which means you can then perceive sound at different pitches, right? So that's the cochlea. And then these are the semicircular canals here. And there are some other bits and bobs in there, but you have more fluid in those and more hair cells and as you rotate your head, I mean, look how that's arranged on three axes, right? As you rotate your head, the fluid rotates, it spins around inside that semicircular canal, more hair cells get deflected. Your brain receives that information and understands how your head is moving. This is one of the mechanisms you use to keep your eyes fixed on an object, even as you move your head. It's, it's a reflex, automatically uses that information and moves your eyes. Clever, huh? So external ear, middle ear, and then inner ear, and that stuff is buried in the bone. And what you can see coming out there, that's one of those cranial nerves that I'm gonna eventually get to. Okay, just before we go inside the cranium and we look at the brain and everything in there, let's consider the blood supply to the head. This here is the internal jugular vein. Um, you can't see it on that side because we've got this lovely muscle here, sternocleidomastoid, covering over these very important blood vessels and protecting them. But there's the internal jugular vein. That is draining most of the blood from the head, from the face and the brain. And if I take that off, we can see an artery is deep to that. This here is the common carotid artery and it's dividing into the external carotid artery, which is gonna to go to the face, and the internal carotid artery, which is gonna to go to the, it's gonna go inside the cranium, because it's the internal carotid artery, it's gonna to go to the brain. And then we also have two arteries in the neck, the vertebral arteries, and those two vertebral arteries will also run up into the cranial cavity. So we have two vertebral arteries and two internal carotid arteries supplying blood to the brain and it might be argued that the rest of the body exists purely to support the brain because the brain is us. The brain is where we exist. That's where consciousness is. The other argument might be that we only exist to serve our gonads because the purpose of life is reproduction. But hey, that's an argument for another day. All right, what's in here? If we take the skull cap off, now what really happens when we do this with the cadaver is that when you take the bone off, you see, um, well, there's a thick connective tissue covering to the brain. The brain is covered by three layers of connective tissue. These are the meninges and the thick, tough covering that helps hold the brain in place and helps support everything is the dura mater. And then the layer deep to that is the arachnoid mater. And then what we can see here I think, probably, I don't know, artistic license. But um, the thin layer that actually covers the brain is called the pia mater. And there are lots of arteries and veins in here um, supplying blood to the brain and running in this subarachnoid space between the arachnoid mater and the pia mater. The brain has an incredibly rich blood supply. And if it ever gets interrupted in any part for any reason, we know about it because things stop working. Now, what we can see here is that the dura mater um, also has blood vessels within it, kind of. So the dura mater is made up of two layers. And in some places, those layers separate and we have dural venous sinuses in there. So the blood from the brain passes to those dural venous sinuses and then down and out through the internal jugular vein. Okay, let's take the brain out. There's the brain. Um, and there's the, the cranial floor. Now, I said that the idea of the brain being in the cranial cavity was important. Let's just, just consider the physiology of this. 
you are sending blood to the brain, the brain constantly needs a supply of blood, and yet it's in this, in this rigid box. Um, if it's a rigid box and it's got a brain in it and other bits and bobs, there's a certain pressure inside the cranial cavity, which means if you're gonna get blood to the brain, that blood needs to be at a higher pressure to force itself into the cranial cavity and the other blood comes out. So if something else is also in the cranial cavity, a bleed, so a collection of blood, or a tumor, or an abscess, or something else taking up space, because there's no spare space in here, then that pressure's gonna go up and things are gonna change. And that's a big part of the physiology of the cranial cavity. Anyway, brain first. So this is, whoop. that's that duramater there, right? That thick connective tissue surrounding the brain and helping hold everything in place. So the brain, um, this is the cerebrum up here that we're looking at. And uh, the cerebrum is made up of a number of lobes. Um, we talk about the, the cerebral cortex because what we're looking at here is the outside of the cerebrum. Uh, and the outside of an organ is the cortex, the central bit is the medulla. And it's heavily folded. And what we're seeing in the cortex of the brain is the gray matter. So the brain is made up of neurons and other cells supporting those neurons. And it's not so much the number of neurons that gives the complexity of the human brain, it's the number of connections between those neurons is, is, is so much greater than the number of neurons. And the gray matter is where we find the cell bodies of those neurons, and then they send off axons to find other neurons and link to other cells. But it's the gray matter that we have the cell bodies and we have those connections. So the folds that we see here, the gyri and the sulci of the cerebrum give more surface area, so more gray matter, so more neuronal cell bodies, so more connections, so more complexity. And the brain is then separated up into lobes. Say this is the frontal lobe here, the temporal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, ah, the insular lobe. But that's the cerebrum, which takes up most of the space inside the cranial cavity. So cerebrum, if we look here, this little brain hanging off the posterior and inferior aspect of the cerebrum, this is the cerebellum. This is even more tightly folded, and that's because it has even more neurons than the cerebrum. The cerebellum is largely involved in, in movements and organizing movements and managing movements, which are incredibly complicated. So there are tens of billions of neurons in here managing all of that. So that's the cerebellum. And then this stalk here. So down here is the, this is where the spinal cord comes in. So the brainstem not only connects the cerebral hemispheres to the spinal cord, but inside the brainstem is where we have most of our basic functions, our basic autonomic functions, like managing how fast and how deeply we breathe, how fast and forcefully our heart beats, um, manages blood pressure and you know, wakefulness, consciousness, all, all those things and more. So the brainstem is crucial in staying alive, um, but it links the spinal cord to the, cere cere the cerebrum. And the cerebrum is essentially where our consciousness and our higher functions are. Uh, and the brainstem has three parts. This is the medulla oblongata, the pons, and then the midbrain is up in there. Okay, the brain. Nerves. Okay, so um, out of the spinal cord come spinal nerves and they go off around the body and they innovate muscles and organs and skin and that sort of thing. Now, when the same thing happens uh, in the head, we have uh, nerves coming out of the brainstem, these are cranial nerves. Most of the cranial nerves are going to structures in the head and they will do things like move your eyes. The optic nerve will carry visual information from the retina back to your brain. Um, there are nerves that will tell your salivary glands to produce saliva. Uh, 
or produce tears. Well, your lacrimal glands to produce tears or your nasal mucosa to produce nasal mucus. Um, and there are nerves like the trigeminal nerve which will carry sensory information back from the skin of your face or will innovate the muscles of mastication. There is the facial nerve which does a whole bunch of jobs but it also innovates the muscles of facial expression. The hypoglossal nerve innervates the muscles that move your tongue. The facial nerve carries taste from the anterior tongue. So the cranial nerves are nerves that come out of the brainstem, mostly go to structures in the head, in the face to control them. So they are gonna pass anteriorly to the face. Now, the vagus nerve travels down to the thorax and the abdomen, for example, the accessory nerve passes out to the trapezius muscle. So, so most of the cranial nerves innervate structures in the head, but some go a little bit further. Now, of course, the brain is inside the cranial cavity, which means that if those cranial nerves are going to get to the face, they need to pass through the bones of the cranial cavity to get to those structures. We have various holes in the cranial cavity which those nerves pass through. Those are called uh, foramina. A hole in the bone is a foramen. If it's a tube, it's gonna be a canal. Um, so we have a number of cranial nerves. There are 12 cranial nerves. They all pass anteriorly or inferiorly to structures of the face or beyond um, to drive a motor something like a muscle or collect a sensory something like a smell or a taste or a vision or a temperature, or a touch, or a something like that. So that's what the cranial nerves are, all right? Uh, one final thing that we should mention inside here is that the brain is floating. The brain is it's fairly heavy, and it's very soft, and all of those cranial nerves are underneath the brain, they're inferior to the brain, and the arteries that supply blood to the brain are inferior to the brain, so they're all underneath the brain. So if the brain just sat on them with its own weight, it would squash the nerves. Nerves don't work when you squash them very well. You know what it's like when you bang your funny bone, right? You get a tingle up your arm, you're banging your ulnar nerve in that case. And also if you squash blood vessels, well, you know, that reduces the amount of blood that can flow through the blood vessels. So um, inside the brain, there are spaces called ventricles. Um, inside the ventricles, there are structures, the choroid plexus, which produces cerebrospinal fluid, which passes through those ventricles underneath the brain, and then the brain floats in cerebrospinal fluid between those layers of meninges, um, reducing its weight, it's the force that it exerts on the structures inferior to it, um, and that CSF continues down into the spinal cord. So cerebrospinal fluid um, surrounds the brain and helps it float. So the brain is protected by it. The brain can move a little inside your cranial cavity, which is most of the time a good thing, sometimes a bad thing with trauma, like sudden deceleration of the head can cause problems with movement of the brain and blood vessels tearing. But that's in another video. Oof, how was that? My camera is complaining that it's very hot, which suggests that I have been talking a lot um, but the anatomy of the head is a very special part of the body. There is a huge amount of anatomy here, but then it is a very important part of the body. We have the brain in here, we have some very special senses. There's a lot going on in the head in a very small space. Um, so there's a lot of anatomy. Hopefully that was a useful introduction to some of the ideas and spaces and structures within the head. And you can like leap off that and watch some more videos about some of those structures in more detail if you if you can bear it if i haven't um if i haven't overdone it a little bit but uh, the anatomy of the human head it's pretty amazing it's pretty great okay i'm gonna stop talking now see you next week <laughs>